a nascent field in astronomy, the search for exocomets or the study of exocomets. This is something new that started recently. And yes, we can do it now from Earth. We can observe exocomets. We can characterize them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our SETI talk. Uh, the SETI talk is a monthly discussion on cutting edge science in the field of astrobiology proposed and developed by the SETI Institute. Uh, this is a free of charge uh, talk. Um, so you, you will hear of us giving us some ideas of how we can be involved in, a, in the SETI Institute in the future. But before that, let's talk a bit about this topic. So exocomets is basically comets in orbit around other stars, other planetary system. Those was discovered quite recently. And to talk about this, we invited two people, two professors at, university, at universities uh, around the world. One of them is Luca Matra. Hi, Luca, how are you? Hi, Frank, how are you? Good. So, Luca, you're an assistant professor at the Trini at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, your research focuses essentially on exocometary belt in the outer regions of planetary systems. Um, you have multiple publications on this field that you're going to talk about, but I want to mention that you're well known for you. Um, you study uh, in high resolution uh, using millimetric wave millimetric wavelength specifically using the ALMA telescope, which is the telescope you have in the back here. Um, you are not in Chile right now, I'm assuming. This is, a, no. this is the background. So where are you calling us from? Uh, I'm in Dublin, in Ireland. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you very much. And our second speaker is Paul Callas. Hello, Paul. Hi, Frank. Great to be Hi. here. Thank you, Paul, for uh, coming to this talk. I've been waiting to invite you for, for several years. We know each other for more than 15 years. Paul is a professor of astronomy at the University of California at Berkeley. He specializes in the imaging of planets, exoplanets, comets, asteroids uh, that orbit near, nearby stars. Um, he's well known for the discovery of um, planet in nearby uh, in the, uh, around the nearby star Pomaro, we're going to talk about that. He's been using facilities such as the Hubble Space Telescopes, the Gemini Planet Imager, to do this research. Um, so I just want to remind our viewers that you can tell us where you are watching us from by using the chat section here. It's active for the next 10 minutes, and then we're going to turn it off so you can focus on the conversation. Um, we love hearing from you, knowing where you are watching us, of course. And of course, you will be able to ask questions in a, in, in a few minutes. We will open the Q&A uh, section in the Zoom meeting here, so you can ask the questions. And uh, Beth, in the background, will select some of the, uh, the preferred questions uh, from the audience. OK, so let's go straight to the topic. I think it's, um, it's, um, it's a new field of research, so I really want us to spend some more time to explain what we can do by the, uh, what are exocomets and what we can do uh, by studying exocomets. What can we learn about our solar system specifically? So Paul, I know you start, you present, you prepare some interesting slides. So maybe you can start. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Frank. Uh, let me get um, screen sharing going here. Um, indeed, I was thinking how amazing it is that I'm even studying something called exocomets. Um, that would have been uh, science fiction uh, you. when I was a student. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been studying exocomets uh, around other stars for a long time. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Hawaii, and that was the focus of my study. And uh, just uh, I thought I'd start out with some background about comets. Um, uh, we see comets from Earth, uh, and what we do see mostly is the dust tails. And uh, these dust tails um, don't vanish. The, the dust continues to orbit uh, the sun. And if you look carefully on a good night, a uh, clear night, you'll see a glow um, uh, right above uh, sunset. And that is the zodiacal light. And this is actually dust in our solar system. 
So uh, that's what we see from Earth. Uh, another way to see comets is um, by pointing at the sun. And here we're using a, a device called a coronagraph, which produces an artificial eclipse of the sun. And on the left, uh, we see a comet that uh, passes uh, close to the sun and survives. If you look carefully on the right, there's a comet approaching the sun and never comes out the other side. Uh, can you guys see my cursor when I use my cursor? Frank, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, so that's that's Mercury there, but the other object coming in is a comet. In fact, this observatory has discovered thousands of comets uh, just by looking at the sun. So that's the inner solar system, uh, but there are uh, objects uh, like comets and asteroids in the outer solar system uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune. And uh, right beyond the orbit of Neptune, we've got the Kuiper belt. And um, as you can see in this figure here, the orbit of Neptune is at 30 astronomical units and uh, one AU is the sort of the Earth-Sun distance. So that's 30 times the Earth-Sun distance. So the, this line is the orbit of Neptune. And just beyond that, there are millions of objects called uh, Kuiper Belt objects. And you can see that the, the, uh, the Kuiper Belt is, um, uh, has a hole in the middle. And that's because of the planetary system uh, gravitationally clears out all the material from its vicinity. So if you were an alien observer looking down on our solar system, you'd probably discover the Kuiper belt before you could possibly even see Neptune because there's so many more objects in the Kuiper belt. And we have short period comets come from the Kuiper belt. So objects are scattered in towards the sun from the Kuiper belt, but also uh, farther out, uh, we have the Oort cloud of comets, and that's more, more or less a spherical distribution of objects. And that's very far out. I mean, if you look at this scale, this is 30 AU. The Oort cloud sort of starts at 5,000 AU and goes out to 50,000 AU. And I wanted to show you the Kuiper belt because these are the kinds of things we find around other stars, exocomet belts. And uh, here on the right, uh, what we've done is we've used a chronograph to block the light from a star called HR 4796A. And we see this uh, fantastic and quite beautiful ring around it. That's a comet belt. Um, we see the dust that's being ejected by millions of comets that are surrounding this star. And for scale, this is actually twice as large as our Kuiper belt. So if this is 30 AU here on the left, the distance from here for the star to this outer edge is actually more than 60 AU astronomical units. And what we don't see though is planets. We think they are there because the shape of this comet belt resembles our Kuiper belt, but uh, uh, we can't see them. And it's not that they're not necessarily there. It's because a Neptune would be very hard to detect with our current technology. We need to wait for future telescopes to be able to see the planets in the system. So just to recap, when you have comets come close to a star or to the sun, uh, you have the melting and sublimation of ices locked in the comet and and primarily the the as the gases expand away from the comet nucleus they launch dust and dust is one of the main components that we see of a comet but what if you're not close to the sun well the other way to produce dust is through collisions so the dart mission uh which was uh, in the news recently uh involves an asteroid being hit by another object and it actually produced a tail just like a comet. So that's what we see around other stars like HR 4796A. We see comet belts because of collisions. Here's another uh, comet belt uh, that uh, Frank mentioned, uh, Fomalhaut. This is actually four times larger than our Kuiper belt. 
And uh, in its structure and its shape, uh, we uh, know that there's a planetary system lying within. And here is uh, an object that's moving in the system called Fomalhaut B, which is a candidate planet in the system, which may be perturbing all of these uh, comets. Here are two more. These look different because our viewpoint is edge on. Before we were sort of looking at these belts uh, from an angle, uh, but what if the comet belts are edge on and this is what they look like. And here's one that I'm actually studying right now. So this is uh, multiple comet belts around a star that uh, actually has two companions here to the upper right. These, these are two more stars, uh, roughly a thousand astronomical units away. And when we look at this remarkable system, we can see that maybe there are planets shaping the comet belts on the inside. And these two stars are probably creating this spiral arm uh, from the outside. So uh, that's my introduction. Uh, these comet belts around other stars uh, can be mapped. They can be uh, uh, measured. So we sort of know the sizes of planetary systems around other stars. And uh, eventually, we'll be able to detect the planets that actually shape these comet belts. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just before Luca uh, give us a presentation about his work as well, when Fomahu was uh, imaged for the first time? So the comet belt um, was uh, observed first in 2004. Um, and it was a really exciting discovery because uh, we weren't expecting, I wasn't expecting to see it. I was actually uh, looking for a planet around Fomahu. And we saw this tenuous nebulosity, like an arc, and uh, our first order of business was to confirm that it was real because we weren't sure if it was something else like uh, our optics creating distortions or scattering or reflections. And uh, so we confirmed it, we published it in 2005. And then in 2008, we, we sh presented the discovery of Fomal Hot B. Nice, thank you. So Luca, you've been, uh, yeah, you started the you basically started a new canon of field with uh, millimetric observations. So tell us a bit more about your research in the field of exoplanets. Yeah. Exoplanets, sorry. Yeah. Do you want me to share the screen? Yes, please. Okay. One second. Now, okay. Okay. So yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you about uh, exocomets and, and my research in general. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about is what are the what are the other pieces of evidence uh, for the existence of exocomets around nearby stars. And like Paul said, uh, one of these pieces of evidence is the presence of dust uh, in orbit within these exocomet belts around nearby stars. And like Paul, I like to image these belts of exocomets as shown in this beautiful gallery, but I image them at a very different wavelength. Uh, uh, which is millimeter wavelengths, which is which is something our eyes cannot see, uh, but it is very complementary to the images that Paul has shown. And uh, I do this with a telescope, mostly with a telescope called uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is my background, but also this image down here, which is actually made of 66 telescopes working together and moving in unison uh, of, and to, to achieve unprecedented resolution and sensitivity to be able to obtain these images. And you can see that in millimeter wavelengths, the star is not so much of a problem. It's much fainter than the cold dust emission uh, that we want to observe. So this is one of the advantages. But what are the other pieces of evidence beyond seeing this is the dust again from collisions? You can see these beautiful uh, features like a gap that is potentially created by a planet in this, in this system. But this is what we're observing here is dust. But there are other pieces of evidence uh, for exocomets. So, uh, so, so, what, so, so what we were talking about is these belts of exocomets at tens of astronomical units depicted here in this cartoon as the, as the blue points. Uh, but you can also observe exocomets as they're scattered in, these, in this red orbit into the inner region of the planetary system. And you can see my little cartoon uh, exocomet here with a tail. And if we are lucky enough that the comet 
uh, in its orbit comes uh, in the line of sight between us. Let's see if I can do this with my hands. In the line of sight between us and the star, uh, then uh, its tail, uh, which is made of gas and dust, can absorb light from the star. So we're going to see a little dip in the starlight, um, and we can see it in two ways. So the gas in the tail of the comet can create, uh, as shown here on the right, a little dip in the spectrum of the star. A spectrum is, is, a, is, a, is a plot of the, of the brightness of the star, the incoming flux, as a function of wavelength. So we see a dip at a specific uh, wavelength that represents uh, um, a spectral line of a specific species. Uh, in the gas. So it could be sodium gas, calcium gas are very common, uh, but also other volatile species like oxygen, um, carbon, etc. And so we can use this to observe the gas in the tail of comets that come very close to the star. So they're star grazing, like the ones Paul showed in the video earlier. But we can also observe the dust uh, dip uh, created by the exocomet in front of the star. And this is much like if you're familiar with exoplanet transits, you can also observe exocomet transits. So this is a plot here on the bottom of the brightness of the star as a function of time. And you can see that we see a flat curve, so we just see the star. And then at some point, a comet crosses in front of the star, and you get this uh, characteristic dip in the brightness of the star. And this is an exocomet transit. So what do these look like in real life? Uh, so this is this is a gas uh, transit from the gas coma of an exocomet, the gas tail. And you can see that uh, if you observe the spectrum of the star, so these are the, if you look at the black curves, uh, over, and you observe it many, 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 many times over decades in this case, you can see that the, these dips come and go, and there are diff slightly different wavelengths which represent the velocity of this comet, which means that what we're observing is we're observing many, many, many comets crossing at different times. Uh, which is quite exciting, and releasing, in this case, calcium gas uh, that we can observe. So, so this is, again, a spectrum of the star as a function of wavelength. But as I said, we can also observe the dust transit. And the dust transit, which was actually predicted uh, to be observable in 1999, uh, is, a, is, is, uh, is supposed to follow this, what I call an upside-down shark fin shape. So if you imagine a shark fin uh, upside down. Um, and why is that? So because if you're looking at a comet tail, like in this little inset image, if you're looking at a comet crossing in front of your, crossing in front of your star, uh, the, the nucleus is denser. So it creates a very sharp uh, ingress into the transit. So the first part of the transit is very sharp because the nucleus is very dense. And then as the, star, as the, as the tail crosses in front of the star, uh, you, you get to see the more diffuse tail, which creates a shallow egress. So whenever we observe a dip in a, in a stellar so-called light curve, so the brightness is a function of time, uh, that looks like an upside-down shark fin, we know we're looking at, uh, at an exocomet. And finally, these were discovered for the first time only a few years ago uh, by the Kepler uh, telescope mission in space, and more recently uh, with TESS, which produced these beautiful uh, exocomet transit light curves, uh, particularly in this beta pic system that has been known to have exocomets for a very long time and is one of our favorites, I must say. And finally, one technique that is very dear to my heart uh, is the detection of gas, not from the exocomets that are close in, but from the exocomets that Paul was talking about, far out in the belts. So not only can we detect dust, we can also detect gas. And again, we can take spectra, so brightness is a functional wavelength. We can take spectra of this gas, we, which we can observe a millimeter and far infrared wavelength. And this spectrum looks like this double-horned uh, profile. And it, again, it, it is a specific frequencies uh, corresponding to specific compounds and molecules uh, in the gas. And we can take images of this gas emission uh, with, with telescopes like ALMA. Uh, for example, Beta Pictoris here, shown at John, as Paul explained earlier, and showing this interesting asymmetry, uh, but also other stars that are seen more face on. And we can see that the dust emission that we spoke about earlier and the CO, this is carbon monoxide gas emission, are more or less co-located, which is indicating that they come from the same, from similar processes, from the exocomets. Um, what's very cool about uh, the detection of gas uh, in these outer belts is that we can start looking at the composition of exocomets. This is amazing. These comets are so far from us in other planetary systems, and we can look at their composition. So far, what we've been able to do is look at the carbon monoxide con content, because carbon monoxide is easier to observe and detect. 
And we can compare it between uh, exocomet systems and solar system comets like Halley, Hillbop, names that you will have come across. And we find so far that actually the CO content is more or less similar uh, to what we have uh, in the solar system. Uh, but of course, we need more and more accurate comet and exocomet observations because these error bars are quite big. Now, the advantage of exocomet observations is that we're probing the entire population of exocomets in the belt at once rather than single uh, comets like in the solar system. But what's amazing is that we have now, this is showing that we now have the ability to probe compositions like solar system comets, but in exocomets very far away uh, around nearby stars. And I find that mind blowing. Um, so to conclude, I wanna bring us back to why we think exocomets are interesting. So exocomets are interesting because they're a window into the dynamics and compositions of small bodies in young exoplanetary systems. Most of these systems that we observe are young and terrestrial planet formation, the formation of Earth-like planets is still ongoing. And these comets are the carriers of these mo of volatile, of, um, of molecules that are the feedstock molecules for prebiotic chemistry, for example. So they may be impacting in this very period that in which they're observing, we're observing them, they may be impacting firming, forming Earth-like planets that may otherwise have formed dry. And in doing so, basically seeding potentially uh, life in these systems. Um, so, so yeah, I'm I'm very excited to uh, to study exocomets, and I think it's a wonderful field. So glad to be talking to you about it today. And that's it from me. Thank you, Luca. Yeah, I also have a lot of questions, and I see that our audience also already have questions. So let's um, let's have a first conversation between the three of us to kind of. Uh, go through a bit more details, um, and then we are going to take questions from the audience. Uh, there is something I really want to talk about right away without, uh, no shame, but let's talk about that because that's the big elephant in the room here, the Borisov Comet. Um, I read, like everybody else, that we have been visited by an exocomet recently, and it's named Borisov. So, Paul, maybe, and Luca, could you tell us what is this Borisov comet? What exactly happened? And what did we learn from it? Uh, you muted, uh, Paul. I'll just start off with the basics. Uh, uh, comets are discovered often by uh, amateur astronomers. And, um, and uh, you plot the position as day after day, night after night. And in this case, Barasov was a comet that is not bound to the sun. Its orbit uh, was hyperbolic. So uh, this was uh, an indication that it came from outside our solar system. Um, and uh, so it's an interstellar comet. Um, and this has been predicted because if you look at some of the disks that I showed, they were huge, and some were even edge on, like to our line of sight. So the the outer parts of these comet belts, some of the some of those belts, some of those objects are being lost to interstellar space. And it was only a matter of time with the improvement in our observing procedures that we would start discovering. Uh, interstellar comets like Borisov. Um, and in the future, the prediction is we'll probably be discovering one or two of these per year. All right. So this is the discovery. But Luca, you mentioned that we want to learn about exocomets, what they made of and so on. What did we learn from Borisov, for instance? Yeah, so what, what I found very exciting about Borisov is that it looked very different in composition uh, to our uh, to most of our solar system comets. In fact, it, what, what it was found is that it was particularly rich in carbon monoxide compared to water. And this, uh, and this is hinting at the fact that um, this comet came, this interstellar comet, Borisov, came from the outer regions uh, of uh, plan a planetary system. We don't know which one, uh, because the outer regions of our planetary systems are colder, and when you're and when it's colder, you're able to um, deposit uh, more volatile molecules like carbon monoxide uh, onto the ice, 
And so a richness in carbon monoxide is indicating that you're coming from a region of another planetary system that is very far from the star. So tens of astronomical units, which is exactly uh, the kind of regions that we're probing uh, with our exocomet belts. So the idea is that Borisov more, most likely originated from a young exocomet belt, uh, just like the ones that, 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 that we're, we're observing with our, with our telescopes. Uh, and this compositional link is also supporting this, is especially supporting this picture. And our detection of CO in exocomets in other planetary systems is a very nice, very nicely ties in uh, with this uh, richness in carbon monoxide for uh, that was observed in Barcel. But we don't know where Borisov is coming from. We don't know where it came from. Okay. The next comet, maybe make next interstellar object, we may we may have more indication. Okay, hopefully, excellent. Um, so I have a question from Luca here. We uh, you talk a, a lot about how we can derive the composition of exocomets from different techniques, right? Just observing the transits, uh, spectroscopy, direct imaging, searching for the gas. Um, those are interesting techniques, but what are the true limitation about um, with these techniques? Why don't we, for instance, know there is water and so on? What what is the limitation? Technological or something else? Yeah, so so a lot of the composition work um, that I spoke about is done in gas that is released very far from the star within these belts at tens of astronomical units. As I just mentioned, it's very cold out there. It's really really cold. So how do we get gas to come out, come off the ice it's it's uh, it, you may think it's quite hard right if you if you take a solar system comet and you put it in the kuiper belt you don't expect it to release much gas because it's very cold out there and the gas and the ice isn't sublimating into the gas so how is it that we're observing gas so far out uh, the truth is we do not yet fully understand uh, how how this gas is coming off comets because we're only seeing the ensemble of comets releasing gas we don't see a single comet releasing gas in the outer regions. So it's kind of hard um, to, to constrain that. But what we think is what Paul mentioned, there's a lot of collisions. There are a lot of collisions going on. We know that because they're producing the dust. There are a lot of collisions going on in these, in these exocomet belts. And if you think about collisions, when you have a massive collisions between kilometer sized bodies, they're gonna get shattered. And when you shatter them, you can release, for example, gas that is trapped in little pockets of the ice matrices. That's one way they could be releasing gas through collisions. The other way is that, of course, when you collide, uh, then you are exposing fresh surface, fresh ice from the interior of these comets. You're exposing it uh, to the elements, basically. And what are the elements in, uh, in, in circumstellar space? The main element is the stellar irradiation, the irradiation from the central star. And so you're exposing the ice, and the, this ice can suddenly warm up and be released. And there's another way that ice can be released that is beyond sublimation, so beyond its warming up. And this is called uh, photodesorption. And this happens when UV light from the star hits a molecule on the ice and it can release it, even though it's, it would be too cold uh, for the ice to sublimate. So there are processes that can uh, release uh, the gas uh, in exocomets within the outer belts, but we do not yet know which which uh, mechanism it is exactly that is that is doing this release. Um, another very different uh, uh, possibility is that uh, comets after formation slowly warm up um, as they absorb more and more starlight over time. And, and as they slowly warm up, they will slowly start sublimating further and further into their interior because their interior warms up last. Uh, and that can release gas through sublimation over time. So that's another that's another option. So observing other molecules beyond carbon monoxide is one way to answer this question of how does it how is the gas coming out? And we're very excited to do that with future observatories. Yeah, because we know how comets release gas, and we have by observing our own comets in our solar system, we know the ratio of CO versus H two O and so on. So by by comparing this for exocomets, you may be able to better infer the, the mechanism to, uh, ex to produce this gas. We exactly. had a question already, I just saw that. No, we're not, I'm doing it the way I want today. It's not, <laughs> but someone asked, so if that's the case, um, in our own solar system, we should have gas everywhere, don't we? But, 
And if not, why not? Very good question. So the belts of exocomets that we observe are hundreds, if not thousands of times more massive than our Kuiper belt. So they're young analogs. So they have a lot more material. They're a lot more massive. And so they will have a lot more gas. So we don't have that much gas, uh, if any at all, uh, in, in the Kuiper belt. It would be actually very hard to observe. We did have a think about this. And it actually would be very hard to very hard to detect, but it wouldn't be very much. That's the main point, because we're observing massive analogs of the Kuiper belt. So the Kuiper belt, when it was very young, uh, you know, now it's uh, 4.6 billion years old. But we're observing systems that are only a few million years old, so thousands of times younger. And these systems have much more massive uh, uh, Kuiper belts. And it's only because they're so much more massive that, that we're able to detect uh, this gas, for example. Right. But also the dust. Yes. So let's um, let's go to another question, which I think um, Paul is gonna like. We know his answer already. That's why. So, mm -hmm. what is your favorite exocometary detection, or exocomet detection, or exocomet planetary system, and why? Paul, you want to start? Yeah, my favorite. Well, the first one I studied was uh, Beta Pictoris which I showed uh, in one of my slides, um, uh, but that had been discovered previously. So I think it was Fomalhaut, which was the big surprise. And uh, really, it's, it's quite beautiful uh, and large when you look at it. And uh, uh, it was actually, a, it was a privilege to be able to, to be able to use the Hubble Space Telescope and to make that discovery and to analyze it all these years. So tell us a bit more about Fomaho. Uh, it's a very bright star, right? We can see it with naked eyes. That's right. Fourth brightest star in the sky, I think. Yeah. yeah. It's a southern, it's in a southern constellation, though. So we can you can see it from uh, for example, California, but it's very low on the horizon, I think. Yeah. So this is a young star. What type of star we are talking about here? Yeah, this is so. Uh, Luca alluded to this, these are all younger than our solar system. So one of the, uh, in fact, Fomalhaut's 400 million years old. Uh, some of the other ones are 5 million years old, like HD 141569 with the three belts, and the three stars and the multiple belts. So one of the, one of the things I, I should have mentioned is that uh, in a way, we're not just mapping the architectures of planetary systems, we're sort of looking back in time at what our solar system must have looked like 4.6 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the issue is that uh, when a solar system is young, it's full of dust, full of comets. There's debris everywhere. Uh, the planets have just finished uh, their construction. The solar system has just been born. And then over time, this process of erosion through collisions destroys the material. Um, so that when you get to an age of our solar system, 4.6 billion years, now we have a lot less dust than, uh, than uh, younger systems. So it's actually hard to detect dust in our solar system if you were uh, from another star. But if we were younger, the our entire planetary region would be would have dust and the planets would be interacting with the dust and the comets. So Fomalhaut is young, as are uh, just about uh, as is Beta Pick. Beta Pick is 22 million years old, um, and just about everything we've shown uh, are less than a billion years old. Okay, what about you, Luca? What is your favorite uh, exocomet or exocomet? Exo Comet detection. I, uh, what I mentioned in my talk, what I find probably the most fascinating is the the detection of uh, dust transits, um, the, like the shark fin shaped transits that I talked about in Beta Pictoris, because it's something that was predicted all the way back, almost two decades before, and it took that long for us to get the photometric accuracy, so the accuracy in monitoring the brightness of the star over time. To be able to actually get this detection that was originally predicted so so far back, um, and it's just if you look at the light curve that I showed from tests with this beautiful shark fin, uh, is uh, 
it's just it's just amazing and uh and you know that dip that i showed it looks like a big upside down shark fin but that is only 0.1 so one part in a thousand of the light from the star so it's a tiny dip uh, in the starlight and it's amazing that, that we're able we have the precision with our telescopes now to detect such small uh, dips, uh, which are, of course, very useful to detect exo exoplanets as well. Uh, but also, it's amazing that we can detect such small bodies. That is a single exocomet. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. The more I think about it, the more I just, yeah, I'm just amazed. Yeah, I do remember vividly when I went to Paris at the Institut d'Astrophysics, and I saw this talk by this young student called Le Cavalier des Etangs, Alain. And he showed this crazy idea and everybody look at each other. At the time, we had no idea that even exo exoplanet existed. It was before 1995. And yeah. I was talking about detection of exocomet. Talk about someone who has a vision before everybody else. So Exactly. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So we are very short on time. We're, we're already late, but uh, um, <laughs> so let me go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how... How did you end up working in this field? You oh. want to start? Yeah, Luca. Oh, I start. Okay. What a story. Um, yeah. Um, I, I really liked planetary systems, and I really wanted to study planetary systems. And at the beginning of my PhD, I was very fascinated, and I was thrown into this uh, into the, into these weird, what we used to be called weird detections of gas in exocomet belts. And people were like, these systems are strange. They have gas. Where is this gas coming from? It was a total mystery. And we only had two systems. And this was only, you know, less than 10 years ago. We had only two systems with gas detections. And people thought these were strange systems. Um, and we didn't know where the gas came from. And uh, I was actually very worried that this would end up being a, a research dead end for me because, you know, these were weird and, you know, why am I studying these weird systems? But it turned out with the advent of new telescopes, uh, with more powerful telescopes like ALMA, that actually this release of gas, it, we, we now think it's the norm rather than the exception. We're finding it in more and more systems and we're actually, we actually now know that it must come from from exocomets, uh, and um, yeah, it's been it's been amazing to see this development from you know something that I thought oh I was studying some weird systems to now discovering that this is actually the norm, and uh, it's it's been uh, yeah it's been it's been just incredible. What about you, Paul? How did you start working in this field? It's... I know you uh, research at the you mentor PhD and mentor, so maybe it's related. Yeah, well, I was always interested in um, planetary science as well as astronomy. Um, so I went to the University of Hawaii, and um, in the astronomy department was a planetary scientist called David Jewett, and uh, he was a good match because I was interested in solar system objects, and and he was um, famous then for studying Jupiter. Um, rings um, and comets and he had a student called Jane Liu and at the time they actually were discovering the Kuiper belt the two of them and I was the second student and uh, he said well um, uh, I you know I was interested in um, in uh, planetary systems and there was a device somebody had made called a coronagraph that was sitting in a lab. And he said, well, uh, while I'm busy doing the Kuiper belt, why don't you take this chronograph and do something with it? <laughs> so I did. And I started looking for disks around other stars and imaged uh, beta pick for the first time in 1992. Um, and that's how I got started. Uh, uh, David uh, became famous for the Kuiper belt basically um, discovering that our solar system was uh, much larger and greater than had been known before. And at the same time, I was studying Kuiper belts around other stars. And that's how I, I got involved. No regret, you, you use this weird device called a chronograph, right? That was, uh, that, was some, that was a good decision. 
I would say. Yeah, yeah, it was hard to use. Uh, and now it's very common. It's uh, chronographs are in the James Webb Space Telescope. Chronographs are in the Hubble Space Telescope. Chronographs are everywhere to study planetary systems. And probably the first time that we're going to be able to directly detect reflected light from a planet around another star will use a coronagraph. Yeah, definitely. Good, that's a good transition for my next question. So you show us kind of a slide with a lot of circumstellar disk, that's the way we call those. Uh, I think we know like 40, 50 of them right now. Yeah. They have different structure and shape. Uh, you mentioned that this is due to the presence of planets probably inside. How you separate the issue of you, not, you don't know what type of planet you have inside. You don't know the composition of the disk. You don't know exactly the size of the grain. So how this is done? What's the mechanism here to kind of infer the, the true nature of this disk or the, the true morphology? Yeah, the morphology or the shape. Um, uh, just using um, the laws of physics will be, uh, will be um, changed from its initial configuration due to the gravity of other more massive objects in the system. So, um, for example, uh, uh, with beta pick, we see that it has a, um, the disk is warped. It kind of has a wave in it. And that was discovered uh, a long time ago in 1997. And the theory was there must be a planet orbiting Beta Pictoris that is tilted relative to the other disk material. And because it's tilted, it's going to warp, it's going to produce a wave. And that's how you explain the uh, shape of Beta Pic's warpy disk. And uh, well, you know what? Uh, 20 years went by and finally we developed the technology uh, and we could directly detect that planet for the first time called Beta Pic B. And in a project we worked on together, the Gemini Planet Imager, one of the first things we looked at was Beta Pic. And it was an amazing moment when we could see the planet without any further data processing. Yeah. The technology had become so amazing, we could directly see the light from Beta Pic B uh, in real time as we were taking exposures. I do remember that moment where we received this message on Slack about this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, and I have one more question for you, Luca. Um, you discuss mostly about the composition, the distribution of uh, those exocomets, and you infer that they could be used to understand the formation of planetary systems. Uh, can you a bit elaborate on this? We are the SET Institute, so we want to hear you saying the word life in your explanation, if that's okay. So go ahead. <laughs> Life, 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 life. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, okay, so, so you mentioned both the distribution and the composition. Maybe let me, let me just focus on the composition uh, to begin with. So, so revealing the composition of exocomets at the time where they may be scattered inwards and delivered onto forming planets is basically telling us in young planetary systems where Earths are presumably forming, do we have a reservoir of, uh, of molecules and compounds on exocomets uh, that may impact these planets and bring these uh, ices onto the planets? Because remember, the Earth uh, formed very cl close to the sun, and the, and the sun was much brighter in its infancy. And so the Earth is expected to have formed uh, mostly dry. Uh, and it's only later in the latest stages of its formation um, that we expect uh, water and other molecules relevant for prebiotic chemistry uh, were delivered to it. So exocomets are a way to provide these, um, these molecules uh, to otherwise dry forming Earths 
uh, and in doing so, uh, provide them with the feedstock molecules for prebiotic chemistry. We have examples in the solar system, like comets uh, YL2 and 67P, where amino acids, the amino acid glycine, uh, was detected. Uh, and we have plenty of evidence for simpler basic molecules like cyanides and sulfides that our chemist friends are telling us are very relevant uh, for uh, prebiotic chemistry that may have happened on ponds in, in the young earth, for example. And the hope is that, of course, now uh, we can only detect few species in uh, exocomets through these gas observations. But the hope is in, in, in future, and as we continue to develop this field, that we can start to detect these very same molecules. Uh, they, are, they may be relevant for prebiotic chemistry in young planetary systems, uh, which, would be, which would be very exciting. So that's, that's kind of one, of one of my goals, I suppose. Um, and the distribution, so the distribution of these exocomet belts, so where they are, uh, tells us that, tells us their, the location where these exocomets formed, but also the location where they didn't form, like Paul said, uh, where there may be planets. Um, so, so, if, so it basically tells us where planet formation has been efficient enough to form exocomets or exoplanets. It tells us uh, the, the location where they formed also tells us what composition we expect they formed with because the location, the distance from the star tells us how cold or warm it is. And the colder you get, the, and depending on the temperature, you're going to get different exocomet compositions. So these are the kind of things uh, uh, we can learn about. One final thing that I'd like to mention is, you know, we talk about the composition of exocomets in the outer planetary systems, and then we talk about potential delivery to Earth-like planets, but they're much closer into the star. Uh, so, but are these comets actually moving around? Do we have any evidence that they are moving around? And we do, right? We see exocomets transiting very close in front of the star, which means that this inward scattering, which is the process of bringing the comets from far out uh, where they form to closer in, is actually happening in young planetary systems. And, um, and, and this is telling, and they may potentially be impacting planets. We don't know for sure yet. Um, but it's it's amazing that we can tell the, the composition of the comets and we can tell that they're moving around and uh, crossing different regions of the planetary system. Good, thank you. Uh, so we have time to take some questions from the from our viewers. Uh, I'm gonna basically read the questions and address to one of you and you give me a short answer, okay? So this way we can go to as many questions as possible. The first one is for Paul. Um, Someone found very weird that the hot cloud is very cold and the Kuiper belt is a belt. Can you explain the reason for this difference? This difference? Yes. Uh, when the solar system was born, everything was in a belt, in a disk. Um, and then uh, because of Jupiter's gravity primarily, but also Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, comets get uh, interact with the giant planets and they get scattered outwards and they go farther and farther and farther out from our solar system, returning, but going farther out. When they, they get far out, they start being influenced by the gravity of passing stars and massive molecular clouds in our galaxy. And these other gravitational perturbations from outside our solar system start randomizing the orbits. So instead of having a, a, a disk of comets that goes all the way out, it starts spreading out into a sphere. That's the answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have a question for Luca. Uh, after carbon monoxide, what are some of the other lines of interest uh, where the signal is strong enough to detect exocomets uh, radiability? with a good um, accuracy, I would say. So yeah, so yeah, so so far, um, carbon so so far, carbon monoxide is the only molecule that we've been able to detect. We've been able to detect other species, uh, but they're mostly atomic species. So there are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, um, other atomic species. And the reason for that is that the the radiation from the central star destroys molecules uh, very quickly. And carbon monoxide is the one with the strongest bond uh, and therefore the easiest to detect. Now, uh, 
to, to be able to detect other molecules, we need telescopes that are uh, more and more sensitive, so can allow us to detect fainter and fainter signals, because we do expect signals from other molecules uh, to be fainter, like water, CO2, and methane. And also, we need to go to different wavelengths, because, uh, for example, water we cannot observe with ALMA, behind me, because water is absorbed by the, um, by the water in our own atmosphere, so yeah. we need something in space to be able to try and observe it. So, so, so carbon ox is the only molecule. We observe a lot of atomic species, including not carbon and oxygen. So we detect, for example, nitrogen, so saying, which is saying that there are other molecules, but they just may be being destroyed too quickly by the star. So we need more powerful telescopes to try and detect other molecules. Okay, so it's a combination of uh, dissociation due to the presence of the light of the star, the star plus sensitivity due to the fact that most exactly. of the instruments are on the ground. Right. Exactly. Now we're going to go back to the story of most of the instruments on the ground later on. I'm betting there will be a question about JWST coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Paul, you mentioned that you, we need to wait for new tech to detect Neptune-like planets. I think that was you say that in other solar systems, other planetary system. Um, do we know at least theoretically what that tech will be able to do and are we are we making progress to to make sure that this tech is available in the future yeah absolutely this is a very active area of um, research not just scientifically but for engineering um, and the idea is to be able to suppress starlight more than ever before so you may have heard that to detect reflected light from uh, a Jupiter around another star, we need to cancel, um, we need to achieve a contrast, as it's called, of one billion. We have to be able to see something that's a billion times fainter than its host star and very close to it as well. So um, when you looked at those uh, uh, videos of the chronographs, um, and the, the images of Fomalhaut and HR4796A, we're not getting that close to each star. Uh, we're getting as close as, uh, in the best case, something like 10 astronomical units uh, from the star. So um, what we wanna do is to get down to one astronomical unit away from a star. So that needs uh, ever more sophisticated chronographs, which involves using the best optics possible. And uh, eventually one of the ideas is to put a chronograph in space. And this is very exciting prospect uh, for engineers is to have a telescope, a free floating telescope in space that is aligned with uh, a, a man-made uh, occulter uh, thousands of kilometers away that will be positioned in front of a star. And using this, these uh, two pieces of technology, uh, we would be able to obtain reflected light images of planets around other stars. Okay, thank you for this clarification. Um, Luca, you mentioned it, but let's talk about this again. What is the relatively relative size of the dip compared to the star the star that you that you have to resolve when the comet passes in front of it? It depends on the comet. Uh, I mean, the ones that have been detected. Um, it depends on several things, actually. It depends. Uh, well, the ones that have been observed, let's start from the from the evidence, the empirical evidence. The ones that have been observed are around, as I said, the one part per thousand. So basically, it, they're at 1,000 times the brightness of the star. Um, 1,000th of the brightness of the star, yeah. Um, about that number. But they vary. So sometimes you can have comets, because it depends, right? Because you're seeing the transit of a comet in front of the star. So it depends on how much dust there is in in the in the tail the more mm -hmm. dust in the tail the more light you're you're going to block out it depends how how big the coma is is it as big as covering the entirety of this of the disk of the star or is it or is it smaller how far is the comet from the star so it, it depends on a number of factors um 
So, but 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 the empirical evidence is telling us that you know the the brightest ones that we are detecting, and there's not that many of them so far, are the, are at that kind of level, the zero point one percent of the starlight. Hope well, we will be able to do better with future photometric mission, which is very exciting because that will allow us to detect uh, fainter uh, dips and so smaller exocomets, less dusty exocomets. Um, which is further exocomets further away from the star, which is uh, quite exciting. So you show Beta Peak. Have you have we seen this kind of dip from comets around other planetary systems, or only around Beta Peak? Yes, Peak? yes, we have in the Kepler mission. There, are, I think, two or three other systems okay. uh, where with evidence of this asymmetric dips. Now the problem is that it's also like a geometric issue, right? So. So if the comet is approaching like exactly along the line of sight to the star, then the, then you know very close the dip is going to be less asymmetric. So it's going to be hard to disentangle from an exoplanet. Uh, so if the dip is very tangential like this, so if the comet is coming in like this, then it's going to be very asymmetric. But if the comet is coming in slowly like this, then it's going to be very very hard to detect. So it, it, it's de dependent on the view and geometry as well. Oh, okay, and that's something you can change. Even you have the best instrument on the planet. No, and the way the way these have been detected is basically people went through the Kepler archive and they looked for for transits that looked asymmetric, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's how they were detected. So so we have a bias against detecting exocomets that create symmetric transits. Okay, we have one more question. The very simple answer for Paul: uh, You show an image uh, an image of HD one four one blah blah blah. I forgot the number. I think it's one four one one five nine. Five six nine. Five six. Okay. What what instrument was used for this uh, observation, and why do you need this this kind of instrument? So that what I showed was Hubble Space Telescope uh, imaging. Um, that uh, we're analyzing. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope has uh, taken images of the system for like ten years, and we are trying to find out if those two stars are moving over time and influencing the the disk and why 141569 uh, another reason is um, it's a James Webb Space Telescope target it's the first disk being imaged with the uh, James Webb Space Telescope so we'll have a lot more information about this planetary system uh, coming up real soon uh, with James Webb. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our viewers for their questions. I'm sorry we're not going to have time to take all of them, but what, what I'm going to do is to send them to, um, to our speakers so they can see them and maybe take the time to answer to them if uh, on, on our YouTube video when they will be posted. I'm right now cutting and pasting the questions while talking to you, which is always something dangerous to do, but <laughs> I succeeded. All right. Okay, my last question. All right, we're starting about, we talk about an, an, a new field of research, right? Exo exocometary science. Uh, could you tell me what will be the major discovery, a prediction from you in this field? or a major facility, a major mission, whatever you want, a major, even a model, a theoretical advancement. I don't like models, but uh, let's talk about that too. <laughs> what will be the, for you in the next 10 years, the big discovery in this field? Who wants to start? Luca, you want to start? Sure. All right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, for me, the most exciting thing that I hope will happen um, is the detection of uh, uh, you know, uh, molecules in exocomets that are relevant for life. So water is one example, but it could be other species as well. So I'm very excited for that. And I hope that uh, telescopes in space, like the James Webb Space Telescope, may allow, may, may, may allow us to, to achieve this. Um, and uh, I'm very excited for that. So stay tuned. Okay. What about you, Paul? Uh, I think for me, it's um, this issue that we we know there are planets shaping these belts, but we haven't detected them yet because of our technology. But the James Webb Space Telescope should be able to detect around, for example, Fomalhaut, a Saturn mass planet. So what I'm looking forward to is uh, in the near future, that uh, JWST image of uh, Fomalhaut. So we can finally see 
uh, if there are any Saturn mass planets in the system, which we infer from the shape of the common belt. Good. I'm the moderator, so I'm not supposed to to be uh, to mention to to answer to my own questions, but I'm gonna say what I think will be a, a big game changer in the field in yes. the next ten years. I think it will be the regular discovery of interstellar comets using those large survey like Vera Rubin and so on. They will allow us to basically be able to analyze the chemistry of other planetary systems. And absolutely it's going to be yeah. an, an amazing big step to understand exocomets in general. Yep. Like yeah. I said, uh, one to two new discoveries per year once the Vera Rubin Observatory um, goes on sky. Okay. Well, thank you very much to both of you for this uh, one hour conversation. It's just one hour sharp. Amazing. Yeah. Um, it was great Thanks, talking to you. Good luck with your research. Good luck with. Uh, new future discovery funding because that's an important part of uh, of our work unfortunately but i know we're gonna hear about exocomets in the future and it's gonna come to from one of you definitely so i'm very pleased we have this conversation session and uh, paul i will come to see you at uc berkeley very soon so thank you again. always welcome and Luca, I'm not sure when I will come to Ireland, but maybe we're going to find some, see each other somewhere in a conference in the future. Thank yes. You. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Well, Thanks, uh, that was our SETI talk uh, by the SETI Institute. So I remind, uh, first of all, I would like to mention that we have more than 200 people watching us live from all the state in United States. I'm not going to say all of them because uh, I think they were like, 30, 42 out of 50 ish so perfect and also all a lot of countries france wales latvia india austria united kingdom turkey chile guatemala italy switzerland canada greece poland ecuador ghana and we have italians too so thank you to all our viewers for watching us and i hope i hope you learn a lot about exocomets and uh, it will it will have caught your attention for the future for the future um, the SETI Institute is a non-profit in institution, so you can support us by simply um, uh, watching us on YouTube, liking our videos, commenting on our videos to get to so more, the algorithm bring these videos and those videos to, to more people. You can support us by joining our social media on every platform. Uh, you can also uh, join our newsletter called Journey, so you know every week or every month uh, what happened in the field of astrobiology, a discovery that are may, being made at the SETI Institute, but also elsewhere. We talk about everybody and every nation in the world making progress in the field. Um, you can also, uh, if you feel generous, make a small donation at SETI.org slash donate, or also sponsor this SETI talk. Uh, we have a sponsoring program, so we have uh, we are lining up the next uh, six months of, uh, of SETI talks with some very interesting topics such as exotic SETI, uh, what is life. Um, I have a ton of them, so I'm not going to reveal all of them. But if you are interested, please contact us um, using one of the generic email address available on SETI.org. And uh, once again, thank you very much to all our speaker. Thank you, Bess, Lee, Jasmine, behind the scene, making sure that this um, Zoom meeting is working properly and be ready to be uh, posted on our social media platform. Bye-bye, and see you next month for a new topic. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.